what do you do when you have an industrial area that's low-lying, that's next to a river, that has a storm system, separated system, that backs up when the tide comes in, it floods all the time, and it discharges to a Superfund site? You do a lot of work. <laughs> So SPU has undertaken several projects in this area. A lot of what I want to do is give you an overview so you can see the context where the water quality facility falls. So I'm going to start with, over, basically, I'm not sure where these bu uh, bullets came from, probably me, but the bulk of the stuff is the last bullet. <laughs> the project is located a little bit south of downtown. It's along the Duwamish River. Um, it, it's in an area, the neighborhood is mixed use. Uh, we, our project is in the industrial area, but there are also residential and, commu and uh, commercial areas in the neighborhood, and there are frequent flooding problems. We've got a 238-acre basin that's draining to uh, where the water quality facility will be. The upper basin is on the bottom, it's higher in, but it's more south. Uh, it's largely undeveloped. Uh, it's up by our training facility. The water runs then across the highway and through a largely residential area and down to the industrial area that's up in that upper right corner past where you can see the highway crossing. The Duwamish River doesn't show up very well on this, but that's where we discharge to. Uh, the Duwamish is tidally influenced up this far, and the tidal influence comes quite a ways into the basin. And right now there's no treatment at all for the runoff from this whole area. This is the land use uh, that we used in the analysis uh, for what, the, uh, what we anticipated the contaminants to be in the runoff. So as you can see, there is some, there's non-conforming uh, residential in the middle of it. It's kind of a hodgepodge neighborhood. The community. Um, this is one of our uh, historically underserved communities. There are a lot of low-income uh, people here with a lot of kids. It's a very diverse neighborhood. Um, drainage and sewer services and roads. This is kind of a typical road in the industrial area there. Not in good shape. And they've had multiple construction projects. They uh, had a major project in their bridge. We did some projects over in their combined sewer basin. We did a cleanup project over in another part of the area. So we really have to be sensitive to them when we're doing any construction here on making sure they can keep their businesses operational. Typical flooding in South Park. This was a 10 to 25 year event that happened at a high tide. Uh, we, it does flood inside. And as you can see, the street is pretty badly flooded. We have reports uh, from the businesses out there and from our staff that it's like two or three times a year that this happens. So the drainage concerns in here. The main trunk that drains uh, the industrial area is a 72-inch pipe that goes to the Duwamish. But any time the tide is up, nothing goes out. So SPU is in the process of designing a pump station to overcome the tidal influence and allow anything to drain. The lower basin does not have pipes in most of the streets. Not only are they not paved, but there is no collection system. So we are developing a plan to install some of that. We're doing that in conjunction with uh, SDOT. It discharges to the Superfund site in the Duwamish. So that's where we're doing the uh, end of pipe treatment that this project is. And uh, our source control has a lot of trouble out here because it's typically small businesses with a lot of turnover. So it's really hard to get them educated and get them into a, a habit of doing what they need to do for source control. Project history, this is a long history. <laughs> We started working on the um, water quality facility as a retrofit project when we first started thinking about improving the conveyance system because if we were going to pave the roads, we were going to have to meet code. If we're going to meet code, we were going to put a passive system in to do some form of retrofit and accommodate future development of the streets. However, as we were nearing completion of design, we got more information on that system, and it seemed that the um, performance was down or the maintenance was way up. So we went back to the drawing boards to see what kind of system we really should put in. Should it still be a passive system, or should we go to an active treatment system? 
Meanwhile, <laughs> while we were trying to figure that out, SPU negotiated with um, EPA on our consent decree on the combined sewer part of things. And we now have an integrated plan that allows us to do some of uh, some stormwater projects that will be more benefit to the receiving waters than the lower priority CSO projects. So we get to defer the lower priority CSO projects and do this one instead. In the integrated plan, this is written in that it will be an active treatment facility and we have certain load reductions that we need to meet. So it really changed the whole design approach. We do want to do this. We think it's a good project. That's why we proposed it in the integrated plan. Because if we're doing all of these other improvements and we know it's an industrial area that we should clean up, let's leverage all of those investments together, together to get the biggest benefit. It supports our, supports our source control in the area. And we really do think it's the best environmental solution. Um, so we went and we did a value planning study on this and we brought in experts from all over. And one of the things that absolutely everybody agreed on is if you're going to do this, you got to do pilot testing. Because most of these technologies have been used for um, industrial sites or for small areas, but not typically for a 238 acre basin in a municipal setting. And so we did do some pilot testing. We brought in HDR to do this. And that's what, the, that's what this presentation actually is about. <laughs> so this is where I'm going to hand off to the one that knows the details. <laughs> OK, so as Sheila said, the project is to develop an active mechanical stormwater treatment plant capable of treating 65 approximately million gallons per year. That's equivalent to about six CFS as a peak flow. So this is not passive treatment. We're talking treatment plant here. Sheila mentioned that there was the integrated plan that developed this project. Uh, that team went through an analysis of what could an active treatment plant potentially remove in a pollutant loading per year. They selected those um, pollutants and developed our annual load reduction goal. So that is our goal that we'll remove from the stormwater. Some people do look at me kind of funny when I say mechanical and they go, what do I mean? So I included some pictures here. It's basically the same thing you'd see for a drinking water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant. But also included down in the right corner is a mechanical, a chemically enhanced sand filtration treatment plant for an industrial site. Technologies that we, are, we piloted are the chemically enhanced sand filtration and ballasted flock. So the chemically enhanced sand filtration, that is simply you add chemicals, it creates a flock, remove the flock, put the water through filters. Ballasted flock is you add chemicals, it creates flock, then you add sand. That helps settle the flocks out really fast. And then your water is, is clean. So we, we heard, um, selected for the job and started working on it. The basic planning had, had been formulated, which is up there. We then started working on filling in all the details. We developed the pilot test work plan that included when we were going to go out and mobilize, what tests we were going to do, what chemicals we were looking at testing, um, the detention times for the sedimentation, all sorts of things that moved. We developed it all before we went out there. We also um, worked on uh, pilot equipment procurement. That one, uh, we developed RFPs that we shipped them off to the three vendors that uh, sell ballasted flock treatment equipment. They all had pilot facilities. So we shipped out RFPs. They were all responded. We looked at them. We selected the Kruger Active Flow. Uh, the reason they were selected is they were the only ones that had a fully contained unit. That was important for us for security reasons. Um, we had a site that wasn't, wasn't staffed. Um, additionally, 
their extra charge, we were planning on four months, their extra charge, if we had to go further, was the least expensive. And having come off a rather drought year the year before, we thought we, there was a real possibility we would have to extend our lease to six, six months. For the sand filtration, we looked at renting equipment from a local vendor that uh, treated industrial sites. That was positive, there was, it was the least expensive, but it didn't have a lot of variabilities to, to let us work with. Like example is the filter depth was two feet. We could not change it, that was it. So we also looked at Intuitec, who we eventually selected. It's a company out of Utah that their sole purpose is supplying and renting pilot equipment, usually for drinking water. But their equipment comes with all the variabilities that you can test, and it's the ultimately flexible. So that's how we select our equipment. We also did a pilot scale test work plan. That was the purpose of the pilot scale is to, let's focus on what chemicals we think are gonna work and what's the dosage. So we start up on the pilot facility, uh, we, we got a starting point. Also, this basin had not had um, stormwater characterization done for it yet. So we developed a protocol for that and essentially it simply was we were collecting stormwater samples at the same time we were collecting effluent samples when we thought our treatment was going well then we could, we could use that sample for two things, stormwater characterization and for determining what our performance was. You see we went into site prep, pilot testing, and then options analysis. It's back to a little bit about the bench scale testing. There is a bench scale tester. You'll see it's got six boxes of water. You put your storm water or any water you're, you're treating into it. On the top, those little black knobs, those are um, um, powering little stirrers that are in there, each one. So you can set the speed of what's going on, and then you can set the length of time that you're gonna mix, and then the length of time that you're just gonna let it settle. And then you can pull off samples. Now, as I said, our goal was to do this, do this early. That was what you're supposed to do. Get this done before you're doing piloting. Unfortunately, what happened to us is by the time we got going, last spring the rain stopped. Literally right after we, we got all our, everything all ready, we got the equipment and everything, we got our chemicals, the rain stopped. It stopped until the pilot equipment came. We never got a storm. So what we ended up doing instead of our plan was to do this at a lab, and we would then have lab analysis, get percent removal of copper, zinc, all that, we ended up doing it on site and just looked at uh, turbidity removal. So we were doing our bench scale testing one step ahead of the pilot testing. Fortunately, we had a direct correlation between turbidity and our, our, our pollutants. So by doing that, it, it, it worked out, but it's not what you normally want to do. So here's a schematic of our pilot test. As I said, we've got two processes we're testing here. First one is the chemically enhanced sand filtration, that's at the bottom. Going into a little more detail, we had pumps in a, a pump pumping out of a stormwater manhole. It um, brought in the water for the two processes. The chemically enhanced uh, treatment process was we add chemicals and then we look, there's a mixer, uh, look for the flocks to form, and then it settles out, so there's sedimentation. And then the water goes through filters. We piloted three depths of filters, one foot, two foot, three foot depths. We also changed the loading rate. And then on those filters too, we were watching the head loss removal. There was pressure sensors on there. Um, if they got high enough, the, it would automatically backwash. Uh, typically, we didn't run it that long. We ran it that long, I think, twice. Uh, but typically, we would backwash it then after we started a new test. Uh, this, that uh, procedure took about three hours to run through because of a slow hydraulic top. It only runs, that pilot unit is four to six gallons per minute. So it took time to run it all through. We usually got steady state around three hours. And once then we'd record it, backwash it, and start a new test. 
The solids, I, I'll mention a bit, but they would go off into a, a holding tank. So for the ballasted flock, that water would go into a unit. As I said, chemicals were added. Uh, the flock form set, the sand was added. And then what would happen is that it would settle down into the basin. It was pumped out, the sludge. It went through a centrifuge, which spun it around, removed the sand, so the sand could get recycled, and the solids go, went off. So both of these, the solids went off to a, a holding tank. We had a, I don't know what to do now. Um, maybe I hit close. Yeah, that's, I think that's the way to go. Close, close, okay. So we had some holding tanks out there. We had um, a couple, well, we actually had three. You'll see pictures of uh, holding tanks, but they're 20,000 20, 20, gallon Adler tanks, which is like a Baker tank. We had a King County Industrial Waste Discharge Permit. So what we did was we put our solids in there. At the end of the uh, vent, typically the next day, somebody would go down there. By then, the solids had settled out. And we had some decanted on the top. They'd pump it off the decant into another tank. We'd grab a sample, ship it to a lab, do a 24-hour turnaround, then ship those results to King County. And all our results were approved by King County. None of them were rejected, but they wanted to do this to, see, to make sure that we were not um, emptying um, polluted water into their side sewers. But then we got the approval to discharge into their side sewer if it wasn't raining. They did not want us to contribute to a CSO because there's CSOs in that area. But that's how we managed our solids. Here's a picture of the site. Uh, bef right after everything got mobilized, there's, the, there's three Adler tanks there. As I said, one was for the solids we pumped into. Her. Next one we used for the decant. Third one was for an emergency. Let's just say we got a bad test result and we weren't going to be able to discharge into the side sewer. What do we do with that stuff? Or we had an upset during the treatment, treatment of it. Fortunately, we never had to use the third, third tank. Next to it is the Intuitec tank. You see that's on the ground, it required a crane to come in and, and remove that off of the truck. Also later on, the filters are high, so the roof, there's a portion of the roof that's, I think, good 10 feet by 3 feet, actually goes upwards, so the filters can ex uh, go higher. So, bottom line, it's not a place, nice place to work in the winter. There's no heat there, it's drippy wet, um, but it's a nice facility for treating, but it wasn't the best, nicest place to be in. Uh, the last one is the ballasted flocculation, and that's the Kruger tank. That place, that, that unit has a little heated office in it, and that's where we had the bench scale testing. So people could get into it in a heated place. So we operated this. Our goal was to do 12 storms in four months, and we got the 12th storm done like five days before our, our four months. We got it in. During that time, we did 28 tests on the filters, that using the filter process, and 15 on the ballasted flock. There's less variables on the ballasted flock, that's why that, that number is less. Um, sometimes we were running long storms. I think the longest one was 36 hours, maybe. Anyway, so it does require a number of people. We we're trying to limit people. We always had two people out there, and limiting to eight hour shifts was our goal. Here's some pictures. This is inside um, the filter unit. There's Pierre. He's one of our lead process people, person. He's looking inside, looking at how the flocks are forming and how they're settling. Here's the filters. See, there's a lot of mechanical piping there. That's what I can say is the Intuitec trailers equipment uh, give you the ultimate flexibility to try different things on your processes while you're, while you're piloting. Here's a picture of the ballasted flock. First thing I want to say is, you know, you look at that and you go, that water looks really bad. 
What I want to tell you is, in reality, it's a well-used pilot unit, and the sides of the tanks are stained brown. So what you can't really see is, on the right-hand side, there's water going over V-notch rears. That water really is looking really clean. But what it is, is there's a motor on the left-hand side. That's the mixer. You're seeing there's another motor, motor that is for the sludge um, pump, and that's what it's going through there. Here's just another picture looking, just showing you all the equipment that comes with that unit. Um, this is just looking a different direction of what the other picture was. There's one of our staff members just looking at how is that that flock settling and what does it look like? And both units were completely computerized. They um, uh, collected at sensors for turbidity and pH and flow that were um, collected. I think turbidity is every five minutes, so we were able to get a lot of data. So you might be wondering, what did this cost? <laughs> Here's a summary of the costs. This doesn't include SPU administration costs. Kind of my summary, when I kind of glanced at this and put these numbers together, what jumped out to me is um, operating, the operating cost in the report, that, that $220,000. That included all the work plans, getting the equipment on site, mobilizing, demobilizing, and operating. And it, it is a high number, but in reflection on it, I will say there, it's more than just going out and running these treatment plants. You have to mobilize early to get the piping. Since we, we did not have a real totally secure site, we did not leave expensive things out. We'd have to get out there an hour early to get things set up, or two hours early when it was freezing weather, because we'd had to go out there and drain things in January where we had some really freezing weathers. So you have to get quit people out there early, then you're running it. We're doing the bench scale testing. And then um, there is at the end the, the, de the demo at the end of the day where we're draining things. There's also at times the weather forecasts are not perfect. We were out there at least f two storm events all set up ready to treat and the rains never came. We could see the Doppler, they're coming, they're coming, and then it would just fizzle out at our, at our site. So, uh, and then we had mechanical failures too at times, just like, just like any treatment plant. This is one of those that I wanted as a manager. I didn't want any problems. I wanted it all go perfect. Let's make sure we just have planned every last, and I probably nagged people a little too much. But then one day I realized, you know, all treatment plants have problems at times, permanent ones. West Point's had problems. So then I, I kind of took a deep breath and tried not to nag so much. So here's the next steps. We are in the process. We have a draft pilot report done right now that's, that is going through the stage of getting finalized. We are in the option analysis phase of the project. Key decisions we need are what will be our flow rate. We, we're starting with that 67 million gallons a year, but what does that reflect to a, uh, a flow rate? What will be our liquid stream process? What I haven't talked about much is solid stream, because there's less choice on that. But we also are developing what will be our process, so how are we going to handle our solids? And finally, once we get it all looked at, too, is how, how, will, how do we think our removal will compare to the integrated plan's goals? So that's what we're focusing on right now. Construction will start 2020. Construction complete in 2021. So summary or lessons learned, I kind of, kind of sat and reflected for a little bit on the project. First thing I want to say is make sure you have, you need a good group of dedicated field staff. Um, I do not know why, but almost every single mobilization on rain event was in the evening or weekend. We had very, very few weekdays out there. Um, 
we never had to ask somebody to go out there. We always said we had a good team and we said, okay, who's available? And it always worked out. It's, I have said, I worked with the best, the best team. Another thing is you really need somebody with construction experience. This is essentially your, you, yeah, we're bringing in these pilot units, but you've got to get the piping to them. We had strainers, PVC pipe. Okay. Um, there were a lot of nuances, and we need, you need a guy there to meet the things, like to coordinate the crane in and off, mob, demob. Um, and we were fortunate we had, um, which, well. Oh, there I am, right there. We had Mike Hallett with uh, Confluence Engineers on our team. He, he, Confluence Engineering had done this a number of times, and his background was construction. He used to be a contractor. So he knew, he knew the, the, the steps to go through it, and I wouldn't try this without somebody like Michael. Um, next one is be, be flexible. That's what I learned when I kind of said I was nagging everybody. I wanted backup plans for everything. Um, take a deep breath and be, be flexible. Uh, and then the last thing, thing, maybe it's obvious in all projects, you need to have clear roles and responsibilities, but I think more so on this type of a project where you've got people working nights, weekends, um, they're coming in and out of the office. It's, it's, I think it's easy to have let it get the management of the project to get out of control. So the key things I thought of was data management. We had a staff engineer, Nate Gockel, that was we signed to coordinate with the lab, uh, get the leg, get the data in, check it all, he checked the invoices, put it in our spreadsheet, and it's really important, otherwise that could have gotten out of control. We also had a dedicated person when to mobilize. Somebody's gotta make that decision and look at, keep watching the Doppler and checking on what's going and get the staff assignments. And then we also ran the, the uh, project with uh, always a lead operator and then with an assistant. We had on our team three um, senior people that had done a number of pilot facilities. Uh, as I think about it, they all came from the drinking water industry. But this is a project that I, it really spans both wastewater and drinking water. So that was kind of my takeaway when I sat down and really reflected on what we'd done on the pilot work. And as I said, we had a really good team this list of the key team members. Everybody got in and, and worked hard on this.